please help me welcome the Maltz Museum's Martin Luther King Day keynote speaker, the, the Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III. I want to take this moment to say thank you. Thank you to the Maltz Museum community for the work that you are doing not only here in Cleveland, but across the nation and across the globe. In the West African tradition, there is an individual known as the Griot. The Griot is the person who is the storyteller who holds the traditions and the values of a community. That in order for generations that are not yet born may understand not only that history is sacred, but there is a spiritual sacred thread that runs through all of our lives. The Maltz Museum has been a griot ensuring that we not only understand our history, but raising the spiritual questions of human flourishing and resilience. And so I, on behalf of my family, want to say thank you. It was a blessing to walk into the Maltz Museum and see an AI version of my dad. <laughs> I said, what's up, dad? He said, Hello. <laughs> and so I want to say thank you for, for thinking of not only my father, but also my mother. Uh, as you know, the two of them, they met during uh, the freedom struggle. Uh, my father was a uh, lieutenant in SCLC, but many may not know that my mother was the office manager for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Now, my mother did not go on marches. Reason being is because she was very clear uh, that she was still working through the ideas of nonviolence. She said, <laughs> said, I'm not quite sure if someone says or throws something at me what my reaction will be. But nonetheless, they met in that movement, and on behalf of myself, my brother Kevin, and my sister Daphne, who now rests with our ancestors, we are grateful for two amazing human beings who are our parents. And Mom, I thank you, and we love you, and we are grateful to you. Also, on behalf of of my family. Monica is unable to be with us at this time. Uh, she was hoping to be with us, but we have had a whirlwind of, of a week. Several things happened. Uh, one, uh, our daughter, Michaela, uh, just started at a new school. She transferred from uh, Claflin College and is now at Mercer University in Macon, Georgia. We had to move her in uh, these past few days. Uh, we're getting her settled. And then our son, Elijah, uh, just arrived back from a study abroad in Ireland. And so they have been busy running around and needing money um, from their parents and whatnot. Uh, so please, I want to thank Monica. She has been going back and forth. She was in Macon. She had to make her way to Richmond uh, as her beloved uh, Aunt Phyllis, who was uh, who was on a ventilator. They had taken her off of this ventilator, and I would ask that you would just continue to pray with her family. Otherwise, she would have been with us on, on this day. And I'm just grateful that there are so many people uh, from the village, uh, the village of Olivet Institutional Baptist Church. I would not be who I am if it had not been for the village of, of Olivet and to my crew, 
uh, from Shaker Heights High School. We have been down with each other since kindergarten. <laughs> And I'm just so grateful for my friends who are truly my sisters and brothers who have shown up here today. I'm just eternally grateful for this honor and this opportunity. What I'd like to do <clears throat> for the next few moments that uh, we have together, and I also want to thank uh, David uh, Schaefer and Rabbi Cohen and Sister Susan and Dahlia uh, and I want to say this about Rabbi Cohen. So Rabbi Cohen, I, I need you. I just, I love your voice, man. I love your voice. So, so I need you and my father to just like record reading scripture. That's all I need you all to do, okay? I, I, need, I need some Torah reading and some gospel reading, and then both of you all just share pro the prophets together. That's all we need, and that will be a blessing. We'll just call it scripture in your ear. That's all we'll do it and we will call Audible and ask them to record both of you all, and it would be a blessing. So the, the Spirit just dropped that in. So uh, Brother David, if you all want to work out a thing just to have the two of them reading scripture, I, I think it would be people across the globe will just be blessed by that. But for the next few moments, I would like to do something. <clears throat> and as we come together on this day, as we typically in the, this nation celebrate uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But I want to frame it from, from a different perspective, borrowing uh, from uh, the text, uh, Dancing in the Darkness, uh, to look at this idea of how do we as a nation dance in this civic darkness? What, what, what do we do collectively? And as we gather, and people are gathering across the nation to lift up Dr. King. But, but I'm reminded of a poet, a poet by the name of, of Wendell Holmes. He was quoted first uh, by Dr. Vincent Harding, who was a good friend of Dr. King and actually edited that Riverside speech uh, where he came out against the war in Vietnam in a powerful way. And it was Wendell Holmes who wrote a poem in 1969, I believe, uh, that goes this way, speaking about how America deals with Dr. King. Now that he is safely dead, let us praise him and build monuments to his name. Sing hosannas to his name and glory. Dead men make such convenient heroes. They cannot rise to challenge the images we would fashion from their lives. And it's easier to build monuments than to build a better world. So, so now that he is safely dead, let, let us freeze him in 1963, simply uttering the words of, I have a dream, a dream that will remain a dream, as Wendell Holmes states, a dead man's dream. So the question as we lift up the legacy of Dr. King, that we must realize that it was not <clears throat> just Dr. King working alone, nor do we want to frame Dr. King in such a way where everybody seems to love Dr. King now that he's dead. It was J. Edgar Hoover who stated that he was the most dangerous man in America. And before his assassination, uh, they had a poll that in the state of Georgia, he was the most hated man in his home state of Georgia. And we have moved from this radical king to where it seems that everybody loves Dr. King. And they have smoothed out all of the radical edges and sold a phrase of I have a dream, not realizing the radical nature of in 63 when he stood before America, he offered an idea saying that, that America, that black Americans had been given a check, that every time we go to cash it, it is marked insufficient funds. He stood before the nation demanding 
not only the right to vote, but speaking about the scourge of poverty and also militarism. That we were more concerned about building budgets to destroy than to elevate the education of the poorest of the poor in our nation. <clears throat> So, so how do we dance in this darkness? To know that Dr. King does not come out of nowhere. He didn't just drop down out of history with no connections whatsoever. There was a village around him, a village what I would call resilience, that helped nurture his spirituality and his theology. This village of resilience, the way uh, that Howard Thurman would put it, that there was always someone who made a way for someone else. And one must understand the connections for us to understand the, the complexity of who Dr. King was and what he means for us today. This idea of village of resilience. I'm reminded of a writer by the name of Alice Schreiner. Uh, who was beloved by another writer I love by the name of Howard Thurman. Olive Schreiner was a feminist in South Africa before the term feminism had actually been created. And there she wrote a book entitled The Story of an African Farm and often would write these essays speaking about you can get a glimpse of that which is sacred if you stare long enough at creation. And as she was a small child, she speaks of the idea of looking at a creek and noticing that uh, there were some locusts that came to the creek. One locust and then another and then another. And then eventually they built a bridge that allowed the entire hive of locusts to go to the other side. She raised the question about how is it, what, what happened to those that made a track to the river's edge and were washed away by history. And she writes to say that for those of us who are on the other side of the water, that we must know that there was always somebody who made a track to the river's edge. They didn't make it to the other side, but if they had not made those tracks, we would not be on the other side of the river today. And I raise the question <clears throat> that though we lift up Dr. King this day, that there are those who made a track to the river's edge for Dr. King. There's a name that many may not know, uh, but who also uh, made those tracks to the river's edge, a person by the name of Reverend Vernon Johns. Reverend Johns, who was born in Lynchburg, Virginia. And as a small child, he only went to school about three months out of the year because the rest of the time he had to be out in the field because they figured that people who'd been kissed by nature's son deserve to be working with their hands in the field and do not deserve to be in schools to elevate their mind and their spirit. But there was something in Vernon Johns. He believed that he was not, uh, he was not called nor ordained to be a sharecropper. He had read somewhere about a school up here in Ohio named Oberlin University. And he decided that he was going to make his way to Oberlin. So he applied to Oberlin. And Chris, it's a fascinating story because when he applied to Oberlin and mailed out uh, his application, he calculated how many days it would take for the application to arrive on the desk at the dean at Oberlin. So he said he was going to arrive at school on the day of his application. Because if they were going to deny him, they were going to have to deny him to his face. <laughs> so he gathered all of his clothes, hopped into, got onto a train and made his way up to Oberlin, Ohio. Showed up at the dean's office and said, my name is Vernon Johns and I'm reporting here for school my first year. The dean, looking at this person that had been kissed by nature's son, was quite confused. He was looking around on his desk and said, uh, son, 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 uh, I'm trying to figure out. I, I don't have your, your application. And then he found on his desk among papers that had just arrived from uh, the mail that he had his application. He opened up his application, looked at it for a moment, and then said, uh, boy, uh, it seems here that you don't have enough credits 
to enter into Oberlin. And Vernon Johns, without missing a beat, said, do you want brains or do you want credits? I got the brains, I may not have the credits. <laughs> the dean was a little bit annoyed and said to him, well, in order to be a part of this school, you have to be able to read Greek fluently. And Vernon Johns scanned the bookshelf of the dean and said, is that a Greek book behind you? May I see it? And then began to read fluently. And he said again, do you want brains or do you want credits? And the dean was upset and said, well, uh, that, that's nice. That was a nice little move there, but you got to be able to read Hebrew fluently. He said, isn't that a Hebrew book to the right on your shelf? <laughs> Took it and read it fluently. They entered him into the class provisionally. Then he graduated second in his class and then eventually was called to a small church down in Montgomery, Alabama, known as Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. And there at Dexter Avenue, because Vernon Johns was such a radical person, here are some of the actual messages he preached. One was entitled, Is Heaven Segregated? And another, and he put out on the front of the church that next Sunday he was going to be preaching, Is It Legal to Lynch Negroes in Alabama? This was all in the 1930s. Now the sheriff was driving by when he saw what Vernon Johns was going to preach and they arrested him for what he was going to preach. You got to be a bad brother to be arrested for what you haven't preached yet. <laughs> so they show up, they arrest him, they take him down to the jail. And there he is surrounded by officers, southern officers from Montgomery, Alabama. And they say, Vernon, you need to tell us what you're going to preach this coming Sunday. This Negro's being lynched in Alabama. And Vernon Johns, looking at all the officers who had guns on their hips, he then thought very quickly and took off his hat. He said, I'd be more than happy to tell you, but I have to tell you, I'm a Baptist preacher. And therefore, he took his hat off. He said, before I can preach, I got to take an offering. And at that moment, <laughs> they started laughing and they let him go. So for several years, he kept preaching, talking about the challenges in Alabama. And the deacon board got together and said, we got to get rid of this brother. And they put him out of the church. Then they organized and said, we need to call somebody we can control. Somebody young, we can tell them what to do. And then one of the deacons raised their hand and said, I, I know of a young man who just got his PhD in Boston by the name of Martin Luther King Jr. And he becomes the next pastor of Dexter Avenue and the rest is history. A village of resilience. There would be no Dr. King if there had not been a Vernon Johns. But many of you think about the bus boycott in Montgomery and we always have an image that it was only Dr. King. But let me give you the truth of the village of resilience during that time period. Dr. King, only 26 years old, Nick, at the time, that he was in a meeting in the basement after uh, this wonderful sage had been arrested in Montgomery. She was a part of the NAACP, had been a fighter of justice, a woman by the name of Rosa Parks. And the ministers in Montgomery had made the decision that we have to do something, but they weren't quite sure what they should do. There was one group that said, we just need to turn it over to the NAACP, let the Legal Defense Fund deal with this. Then another group said, no, we need to have a boycott for two or three days so we can negotiate with the city. And as the men were arguing, there was a group of sisters in the meeting. That group was run and organized by a woman by the name of Joanne Robinson. She was head of the Women's Political Council, had been fighting for the rights of those who've been marginalized in America for quite some time. And back in the room with uh, Rosa Parks and Joanne Robinson, they were listening to all the brothers arguing, and Joanne Robinson told the sisters, come on, let's get out of this room. We, we gotta leave, the brothers will be here arguing all night. We're going to go over to Alabama State, where she was a professor, and we're going to go ahead and start the boycott. So they went over to Alabama State, and they decided to uh, create flyers on a mimeograph machine. Now, for those of you who've never heard of a mimeograph machine, that was before a copy machine. You had to crank the thing to roll it out. 
And they printed 55,000 flyers in eight hours. That by, time, by the time the sun came up, they used young black paper boys to deliver every flyer to every black household in Montgomery. So by the time that Dr. King woke up, got his coffee and his paper, he looked and saw that there was a flyer, he said, I guess I'm a part of a boycott now. <laughs> but because of the organizing power of women that we do not lift up from this village of resilience. Joanne Robinson, with her incredible power. And if we as a nation are going to transform this particular democracy, we must need the, we need the griots who understand the stories and we must create a village of resilience to raise a generation that has moral imagination. Moral imagination, what is this idea? Moral imagination simply means that I can see a future, though it is not, I will act as if it is. A moral imagination raises questions for the least of these. A moral imagination is what Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel were attempting to do. They were speaking into the hearts and lives of those who had gone astray. One of my favorite stories of moral imagination. I mean, I absolutely love this brother and many people have, have never heard of him. It's a gentleman by the name of Robert Smalls. Robert Smalls, who was born in Beaufort, South Carolina, as an enslaved African. But in his spirit, in his mind, along with his wife, once his child was born, Sabrina, Robert Jr., they, they made a decision that we will not allow our child to grow up as chattel. And so we are going to escape to freedom. But this is in Buford. They had been moved to Charleston where they were serving. They were, uh, they were enslaved. And they hatched a plan along with 11 other enslaved Africans that they would go toward their freedom. They were not going to run toward their freedom. They were not going to ride toward their freedom. They were going to steal a Confederate warship and sail to their freedom. <laughs> this thing is better than Oceans 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I'm telling you, they, they stole a Confederate warship. Because Robert Smalls and several other Africans were, were working and cleaning on Confederate warships. And the strange thing about racism and white supremacy is it's arrogant and ignorant at the same time. And so it was Robert Smalls, along with these several other Africans, enslaved Africans, who were called to clean the ship and repair the ship and even drive the ship, but they couldn't be captains of the ship. And so what they did is they memorized everything about that ship. And there were two uh, Confederate officers that they knew every night around 8 p.m. got drunk and went to a house of ill repute. They did it every night. And so they decided that on one particular night when they got drunk and went to the red light district, that they would then bring their families on board the ship. They had memorized every Confederate code. And so as they began to sail the ship, in order to get out of the Charleston Harbor, you first had to know the necessary codes to be able to share to the harbor master. Robert Smalls put on Confederate clothes. The sun was not yet up, so there was only a silhouette of this man who was an enslaved African acting like a Confederate soldier. He stood on the bow of the ship, and when they got to the harbor master, he did his thing doing this, and the harbor master said, go on with your bad self. <laughs> and they started sailing to freedom, but you must understand the history. It was the Union forces that had ongoing orders that any ship that comes out of the Charleston Harbor that has not surrendered, you are to fire on it immediately. And as they were sailing out, they had not yet reached freedom. And they were trying to think what to do when they saw at a distance that there was a Union ship that had its guns trained upon them. And it was Sister Smalls, Robert Smalls' wife, who said, find a white sheet and run it up the pole and let them know that we have surrendered. They found a white sheet. They ran it up the pole, Kyle, uh, but something else happened. A fog came into the harbor. No one could see the white flag of surrender. 
And so the Union ship trained its guns upon Robert Small's ship at that time and began to count. They said one, they said two, and as if on cue by Steven Spielberg or something, all of a sudden the sun came out and burned off all of the fog. They saw the white flag and then they said, halt! And they boarded the ship. And here are these Union soldiers. They keep running around the ship looking for somebody white. They couldn't find anybody white on the ship. And Robert Smalls says, I, Robert Smalls, give this ship to Abraham Lincoln for freedom. And all of the cargo here, we are human beings and we seek to be free. It would seem that that would be an amazing story in of itself. But it doesn't stop there. He gives a Confederate warship and the Confederate codes to the Union Army. <laughs> then becomes the first officer in the armed forces in the United States of America. <laughs> Fights for the Union. But it doesn't stop there. The brother believed in equality of education and he had several daughters. He made sure that his daughters went to Oberlin and University of Pennsylvania and went to France to study along with his son. But he couldn't stay in Philadelphia. He said he had to go back south to help those who were struggling because they had the weight of what was known as the uh, Confederate, Confederate ghost of white supremacy upon their back. And so he goes back to South Carolina, where he had been born, goes back to Beaufort, South Carolina, where he was enslaved, and he buys the house and plantation where he was a slave, and then allows the mistress to live on the property, not in the big house, small house out back, by the way. <laughs> he then starts four schools for formerly enslaved Africans, private schools, but he said this is not enough. He becomes one of the most we the wealthiest person in South Carolina, but then he decides to run for Congress and he wins. And while he is in Congress, he lays the foundation of a policy that we still embrace this day. He sets the foundation of what we now know as early childhood development and education, better known as the public school system. So the next time you walk through the doors of a public school, say thank you, Robert. We appreciate you. <laughs> Utilizing one's moral imagination. And in this country, we are lacking the idea of teaching moral imagination to the next generation. We cannot turn over the imagination to corporations. We cannot turn over imagination to Silicon Valley. And we certainly cannot turn over our imagination to those who think they're controlling Congress. We cannot turn our imagination over to those. We must recognize that there is power when there is a village of resilience and we are willing to utilize our moral imagination. If I may share a story of the power of utilizing your imagination, what can happen in moments when you are open to the possibility of the spirit. As I remember in 2008 when there was a gentleman in our congregation at Trinity United Church of Christ who was running for president, a senator by the name of Barack Obama, who eventually became president and now is in retirement as president. Uh, but we, he was running for president in that moment. Uh, there's something happened in our church. I remember I was at, I believe it was, uh, at the time it was called Bally's uh, Fitness. I was on a treadmill and someone tapped me on the shoulder. I was doing my warm down, Ed. And someone said, is that your church on the news? And I looked up and I saw Sean Hannity just going off. And I said, well, I guess I got to leave right now. And at that moment, over 40 outlets were showing up every Sunday because they took a piece of my predecessor's message out of context and blasted it all over conservative radio and television. 40 outlets every Sunday. But then the death threats began. That we had letters that we would receive every day from my predecessor, Dr. Jeremiah Wright Jr., and myself, and the church. We had to have bomb-sniffing dogs show up every time we had any type of event. 
We had to hire new security. I had my own personal security that had to follow me everywhere. It got on my nerves everywhere I went. I was like, can I go in here by myself? Nope. I was like, OK, I've got to go wherever you go. So the security was with us consistently. And it does something to your spirit when you're consistently looking over your shoulder, wondering if this person walking up to you is friend or foe. And one night, I was trying to sleep, and that is uh, the operative word, trying. Because I did not get much sleep during that time period, uh, maybe an hour and a half to two hours. And we heard something in the house. And Monica tapped me on my shoulder and said, you need to go check that out. <laughs> and I grabbed my rod and my staff that comforts me. <laughs> it's from Louisville. It's a Louisville slugger. So there I was walking around the house, trying to figure out what this noise was. Also wondering, is this the moment? Is this it? After all of the letters, all of the emails, all of the people who had been showing up, was this the moment that someone, some crazed individual who had been listening to conservative radio made the decision that they were going to take out an individual? And so I looked around the house. I heard the noise again, the noise coming from my daughter's bedroom. And then I go into my daughter's bedroom, and there is my baby girl, all of five years old. She is in the middle of her room, and she's spinning and dancing. She says, look, Daddy, I'm dancing. Pigtails just spinning back and forth. And I say in my fatherly voice, because I had to preach in several hours. It was 3 AM. I said, baby, you need to go to bed. But she kept saying, look, Daddy, I'm dancing. And then at that moment, the Spirit said, stop and listen. Look at your daughter. Your daughter is dancing in the darkness. The darkness is around her, but the darkness is not in her. And in that moment, I scrapped my sermon for Sunday, ran down to the study, and then began to write uh, what was moving in my spirit. And when I stood into the pulpit on that day, I stood before the congregation and told them that we are called to dance in the darkness. Just like little Michaela, the darkness may be around us, but it is not in us. And if we are to see transformation in this fragile democracy, we must dance. Dance with love plus justice. Dance with compassion and joy. Dance with forgiveness and grace and mercy. And if by chance we learn how to dance, we will see transformation in this democracy we call the yet-to-be United States of America. Let us learn how to dance in the darkness. What I wanted them to know, and what I want you to know this, that this moment, when the darkness shows up, it does not mean the sun has forsaken us. It just means that the earth has turned. But if the earth keeps turning, the sun shall rise again. So dance, as the psalmist says, will turn your mourning into dancing. Dance, and eventually joy will come in the morning. And if America chooses to dance, if we choose to build a democracy in these yet to be United States of America, something will happen. There will be a transformation when we merge love and justice together. Not love simply, not justice by itself, for love without justice is simply sentimentality. And justice without love can become brutality and legalism. But when love and justice get married, they walk down the aisle and are betrothed together and eventually will have children, one by the name of transformation, the other by the name of liberation. If we are willing to merge these values together and we will see something unique in these United States, these yet to be United States of America, whether you are black or white, whether you are Jew or Gentile, whether you are atheist or Anglican, whether you are Buddhist or Baptist, Muslim or Methodist, queer or Quaker, bougie or broke, urban or suburban, redneck or trap city, Pentecostal or Presbyterian, Hindu or holiness, Sikh or sanctified, whether you graduated magna cum laude or just thank you, Lord, something will happen when we come together and merge these values. And if we merge 
merge these values together. We will be able to sing like the bard of South Central LA by the name of Kendrick Lamar. We can say together, we gonna be all right. We gonna be all right. God bless you, God keep you, and let us dance in the dark.